let's call the roll. Um, I'm gonna start with how people appear on my screen. Elizabeth, are you here? I'm here. Yana, how about you? I'm here. Maria? Yes. Jeremy? Yes. Sherry? Yes. Eileen? Yes. Daniela? Yes. I am also here. You will be glad to know. And welcome to Sue Hers, who's here from the public. She's going to make a couple announcements. And welcome to Jim, who I know is here and I know is having problems with the camera. So. Yeah. So I, I might disappear for a moment yeah. to, to try to fix we, this problem, which is. Yeah. It's fine. We yeah. like to start our meeting with a check in. So we have a couple more minutes of um, chatting before you will be called upon to do anything. And, and Sue's going to speak before you in the public comment, uh, the public participation section. So take your time. So thank no rush. Oh, and here's Nicole. Hey, Nicole. We are just starting and I'm going to start with a check in. So let's see, what should our check in question be? How about um, What is your favorite way to stay warm? And I will say that my favorite way to stay warm, as you can possibly tell, is wearing many layers. So I'm currently wearing a sweater and a flannel and a shawl and this wool blanket. Uh, and normally, if I was sitting in my living room, I would also have like a hilariously gigantic comforter that my husband calls the burrito. Um, so that's my strategy. Uh, and I will popcorn to Daniela. How about you? My favorite way of staying warm is with a fire. When we were buying our first home, that was one of the requirements is that it needed to have a fireplace or some sort of like wood stove. It also is just sometimes super efficient to heat a house up like that. Um, but yeah, this house came with two, so we were lucky. <laughs> um, I'll go with Elizabeth. Uh, mine is probably also wearing a lot of layers. The moment the temperature drops below 60 degrees, I start wearing long underwear because uh, I'm always cold. Um, and I've got like this fleece lined flannel on right now over several other layers um, and two pair of pants and a blanket. Um, I can add more layers as I go or take layers off if it gets too warm, but it won't because I keep my house around 65. Um, so I like to bundle up um, and I always have a hat sitting next to me so that I can add a hat in case I get too chilly. Nicole. Hello. So I'm usually always very hot. So I, um, I don't do all that, but my toes get cold. So I have like a lot of fun, funky, warm socks that I like to wear. And my head gets chilly, but nothing else on my body gets cold. So that's why I have my hat and I have my, I don't think I have my fun socks on today, but and I'll go with Sherry. My husband, one of my husband's many nicknames for me is the human electric blanket. So staying warm isn't always that difficult because I make my own climate, but I'm with Benny. If you need to get warmer, you just put on more layers. I don't believe in turning up the thermostat any more than absolutely necessary. It just produces brain fog. And how about Eileen? This Christmas was like the every gift was some sort of heated blanket wrap co it, it, like everything came with a battery pack to make you warmer so that was kind of cool um and my wife and I actually bought each other the same heated blanket in different patterns weirdly enough so you know maybe turn the heat up but <laughs> really just plug in all those heated blankets so uh Jeremy how about you yeah I would say uh I'm similar to Nicole I don't get too cold but um when I do, let's say like if I'm ice fishing or something, get in the, the house with the wood stove, 
that we have on the ice or um again we have like a gas fireplace in the house so it heats up right away so but uh and then you know good old-fashioned cup of hot chocolate um really warms me up when i'm really cold so but uh, like i said normally not that cold i don't really wear a winter coat unless it's like negative degrees without the wind chill so <laughs> but anyway um how about yana um when i'm cold um my dog jamie i think most animals are just really warm and jamie's very warm so i always see him like on the couch i go right to him and snuggle with him and it's like his armpits are like so hot so i just stick my hands under that and like that warms me up instantly <laughs> um how about maria Um, I love I love hearing everyone's different methods. This is so entertaining. Um, so I am like Elizabeth, except I I'm cold when it drops like below 74. I don't know how I grew up in New England. Uh, it, like <laughs> I am cold all pretty much from like end of September to May. Um, <laughs> and uh, so yeah, I have a microwavable like a kind of like a buckwheat kind of thing. I'll put that in the microwave, wrap it around my neck, get a hot chocolate that keeps my hands warm, layer up blankets. Yeah, that's that's my my general <laughs> winter attire when I'm not on Zoom meetings. <laughs> um, let's see. Sue, uh, Sue or Jim, I don't know if you want to contribute. <laughs> sure. Um, go ahead, Jim, you want to go first? Sure. I, I don't know what the question is because I really just got here. I apologize, uh, but I was uh, I was having trouble for some reason getting the video to work, which since I've got some PowerPoint to share, that would have been terrible. So I had to go through the restart of the computer twice and somehow magic happened. So here we are. So the question is, what's your favorite way of keeping warm? Oh, boy, you know, I have one of these bodies that just stays warm. So I'm I'm the person with no coat on. I'm, I'm fortunate that way, but it's it's a disaster come summer. Uh, you don't want to see me then. Okay, and I could say the same thing as everybody, except for Nicole and Sherry, I think. <laughs> um, but I just to be different, I will say that one of my favorite ways to stay warm is to hug people and my dogs. Any living being that will do that, that's a favorite way. That's extra delightful. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> uh, and well then, Sue, you can take it away. You are our mm -hmm. member of the public if you would like to uh, uh, do any public participation. Thank you. I hereby publicly participate. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to say, I will ask you, Nicole and Benny, another time how you do this closed captioning, because I'm just seeing what it's like. Because Someone has asked for it in another meeting and um, now I see it works. Anyway, um, so I'm here with two announcements. Um, one is about a Holocaust forum that's going to happen um, on April 28th on Zoom. And there will be people who live in, there'll be um, between three and five of us, between three and six of us speaking. We haven't nailed it down yet, but, um, including people like myself from Wakefield and then some people from Melrose, all of whom are adult children of Holocaust survivors. So um, we will tell, we'll each speak for um, a few minutes and we'll intersperse it with some historical snippets that um, probably my rabbi will present. Um, and it's being sponsored by the Melrose Human Rights Commission and the Melrose Clergy Association. So we are asking you guys, whether the Wakefield Human Rights Commission would also be willing to sponsor it. And we're separately asking the Wakefield Clergy Association, whatever it's called. And sponsoring it um, means that you cook my dinner for me every night. No, not really. Sponsoring it means that you your name goes on the flyer, essentially. Uh, it, it's just a public way of showing support for this. So you can discuss it after I leave if you want, but that would be really wonderful. Um, and second announcement is about the Conversations About Whiteness course. Um, I think some of you have taken it. It's a course 
designed by white people for white people to unpack whiteness. Um, and it is, so we do it that way to maintain it as a safe environment. Um, and it basically shows, and it's a five week course, it'll be five, the five Thursdays of March from seven to 9 p.m. And it basically shows how, um, although we might look at George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey and so on and say, oh my God, the system's broken, we just need to fix it. It helps reinforce the awareness that the system is not broken, that it was designed this way, that it was designed to pit black and white people against each other and to keep black people um, below white people in the social universe and economic universe. Um, and you really get it in your gut. You get it in your head and you get it in your gut. Benny's co-facilitated this course and maybe, um, yeah, and I see some familiar faces have taken it. So if you haven't yet taken it, um, it's not too late where it starts March 3rd um, and there's a library page that uh, describes it and shows you how to sign up. So just wanted to welcome you guys as members of the Wakefield Human Rights Commission to unpack whiteness with us. It's really a powerful experience. So those are my two public inputs. I'm thinking, Sue, while you're here, it probably makes sense for us to discuss the um, the sponsoring the Holocaust Memorial rather than waiting until you're gone. Because if anybody has questions, then that makes it harder. Oh, that's so a good point. If anybody has any like thoughts, reactions, ideas, feelings, please share. Yeah, sure. I, I don't know if Sue was aware of this, but we actually invited one of the people from Melrose, or two of the people from Melrose, I believe, uh, to speak directly to us at one of these meetings. Yeah, Sue was one of those people. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Except I'm from Wakefield. That's right. I'm sorry, Sue. That's okay. I'm <laughs> glad you remember that it happened. We came in December, and you guys were really very welcoming. And we, kept, we knew we were gonna be doing something, but we didn't know what. So part of the point was we wanted you to get a sense of us and what it means mm -hmm. tell whatever that was, I think two minute stories. Um, well, the fact I think that we um, had invited you and Steven, was that his name? Uh, Jerry. Jerry, oh, I'm, I'm doing Jerry well tonight. I'm doing great this week tonight. Well, okay. that, that we invited you to speak before us, I think shows that we are very open to this kind of forum. And I personally think it would be very appropriate for us to be a co-sponsor. Elizabeth, I saw, yeah, I saw your hand come up too. I just have a logistical question that maybe I wasn't listening closely enough to. Is there a time set yet for this, Sue? No, no, it'll be okay. evening. It's April 28th, it's a Thursday evening and it's um, internationally, it's uh, Holocaust Memorial Day. Right, I just yeah. went to put it on my calendar and was like, what time? But yeah. if it hasn't been decided yet, I will write it down loosely as an evening thing. Cool, cool. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I think we will get to, once we're, we'll deal with all that very soon. You know, we'll, we'll make a flyer with whoever the co-sponsors are and nail down a time. And yeah, it'll all be on Zoom, of course. God forbid anybody should, that we should leave our houses, right? Separately, would do you already have someone reaching out, or would you like me to send this on to um, the Interfaith Clergy Association in Wakefield? Part of my role is to bring things from the HRC to them. Oh, okay. Well, you might want to talk to Rabbi Greg. I just talked to him out of. He's not my rabbi. I'm. I go to the Melrose. Yeah, I know him. Um, yeah, yeah. So he's planning to say something, but um, if you guys want to, awesome. I'm sure he'll. That would be great. I'm <laughs> sure he will put it together in an email and send it out to everyone. He is great like that. Yeah, yeah. Good, thank you. Thank you for the offer though, that's very kind. Yeah, feel free so to remind if we, <laughs> if we want to sponsor it, I, you know, we could post it on our Facebook page. Sue, oh, I wanted to ask a question about this. Sue had emailed me asking about this topic and said, could you send it out to your email list? And then I was like, we don't have an email list, but I don't remember why. Isn't there some reason that we're like not allowed to have an email list or something weird like that? Yes, it, it has to do with, um, the, there was a discussion about this uh, probably three or four years ago that like no 
town group can send out email. Um, it, it has to do with like the, the email system with the town and uh, yeah. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I know it, it was not something that we could do. Now, again, that was easily, easily three years ago because it was definitely well before the pandemic. Um, so it, yeah, it might be worth looking into. So it wasn't some kind of weird public meeting weirdness. It was like a technological problem with the town's email server right. or something. Okay. I can reach out. Who's like, who's the tech person, Maria, that you were talking to about our electronic storage? Um, I will find that name and I'll email it to you. Yeah, that'd be cool. Because I'm happy to reach out and try to figure out. Because I think people, not often, but occasionally ask about our email list. And I'm like, eh, we don't have an email list. Like, check us out on Facebook. Right. Um, so I think it would be cool if we had an email list. Uh, yeah, so send me the name if you can find it, Maria. That would be good. Okay. Cool. So, are Any there other questions? Thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Are there questions that about it. Okay. I see some thumbs up. Should, is this something we should vote on? Should we have a motion? I move that we co-sponsor the. Holocaust Memorial event. Second in. Nice, okay. I'm gonna go around in the same order that we did our check-ins. So, Daniela. Yes. Elizabeth. Yes. Nicole. Yes. Jerry. Yes. Eileen. Yes. Jeremy. Yes. Maria. Maria might have had to run away for a second. I also say yes. Wow. Thank you. All of life should be like this, right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> now you have many meetings ahead where you walk in and say, hey, how about X? And everybody says, sure. And then you go on to the next thing. Yeah. Sorry, Maria, I had to jump out for a second, but. How do, how do you vote on our motion to uh, co-sponsor the uh, Melrose Holocaust Memorial event? Emphatically, yes. Great. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank so you, much. Sue. Thanks for bringing this. Oh, my pleasure. And hope to see you at the conversations course if you haven't taken it um, and if you're wide identified. Okay. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. -bye. Um, I click on leave. So without further ado, Jim, thanks for sticking around through our check-in and our public participation. But now the floor is yours for maybe 10 minutes or so to talk to us. I invited Jim. So Jim gave an amazing talk during um, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, the Indigenous Peoples Day events that were happening in Melrose about the Indigenous peoples of this area. He gave this talk along with Farius Gray, who's the Sagamore of the Massachusetts tribe of Ponkapog. And in the process, me and Eileen have been writing a draft for our, um, our land acknowledgement that the WHRC might be using which we'll discuss afterward, after Jim speaks. But in the process of doing that, I had reached out to Jim to ask some clarifying questions about the indigenous history of this area. And then we thought it could be appropriate for Jim to be our guest speaker this week. So Jim, welcome to the, the Wakefield Human Rights Commission. Thank you very much for that uh, that kind introduction, Betty. It's such a pleasure to be here north of the border, uh, at least uh, in some in some virtual way. And I should say, yeah, I gave that presentation with um, Sagamore Farris Gray, and I should just acknowledge that I am uh, a white non-Indigenous person who's speaking tonight. So there are other ways of knowing that are in Indigenous communities and other ways of remembering the past and I can tell you something that is very documentary based, that's based on documents that were written by Europeans, and that's what I'm very comfortable doing. That's where my expertise is. But you should really, of course, in this process, um, seek out the counsel of, of Indigenous peoples themselves, who, of course, is how who you're trying to serve. And I should say, I got interested in Indigenous history because a few years ago, because I would hear these land acknowledgements. And I would always have questions about them. Like, first of all, why is it that one person is citing one 
tribal group and another person cites a different tribal group right on the same spot. So do we actually know right who was there? Very basic question. And then secondly, it gets into the deeper question of are we doing this kind of performative thing or are we actually doing something very important when we acknowledge land and how can we do that better? So just a couple of thoughts um, on that and I'll get right into a PowerPoint presentation now, which I promise will be very brief because I have about 10 minutes. Uh, when I put this together, it was basically a just the facts. What would you need to know if you landed in Wakefield, had never been here before, knew nothing about anything and needed a really quick um, summary? So that's what I'm going to give you. And there will be a lot of unanswered questions. So if there's something that I didn't answer during this presentation afterwards, please let me know. So let's see. I will share my. Oh, can I share my screen, Benny? And good, okay. And here we go. Let me just start this. And oops, already went too far forward. So uh, here's the page that I'll just begin with. And I just want to point out that I deliberately chose to put in the seal of the town of Wakefield because I think these are always interesting to look at because typically they don't acknowledge something very important, which is, I don't know, the first 12,000 years or so of human habitation. So you'll see the first date for Wakefield is 1644. Then we go to 1812, 1868, significant dates. But your seal is so interesting because it does acknowledge a native man right in the middle of it, that name Quanapowit, which I'll talk about in just uh, a second. But I think, first of all, it's so important just to um, put this in the vast perspective of Native history. So I find charts like this to be really helpful. If you look at it, just about 98% of the history of Wakefield is from before Europeans arrived here. It's an enormous amount of time. If you lift up any backyard in Wakefield, if you start poking around, you're probably going to find Indigenous artifacts back there, simply because Indigenous people have been here for so long. So when we talk about who was here, we're talking about who was here in terms of people we can name um, the people who were here about 400 years ago. But when Europeans arrived here, they ar arrived at this very specific moment. And in the vast time before that, there were so many different peoples under names that we will never know, uh, a vast chronology that it just in many ways is lost to us. So who was here when Europeans arrived? Well, I called them Wakefield's first family, not because they were the first family here, but because they're the first family who we know by name. And the names that you see here are pretty well established. Uh, it's always just a question for people of what tribal group are they a part of. So as you can see, it's presented here as a nuclear family because these are the names we know. Um, there was a great leader by the name of Nani Pashamet who when Europeans arrive here, he has just died. He's been killed in a raid. But all of the native people in the region are reacting to the fact that there's a power vacuum because Nani Pashamet has died. His widow who's left has a name that can be a little hurtful for some people today. And I think that needs to be addressed. She is known to us in records always by that first name you see there, Squaw Sakam. And Squaw is a word that has been wielded against indigenous women um, in very unfortunate ways. But that's the only way we know her. And sometimes people were Refer to her as the Sonk Squaw, which is actually the Narragansett native way of saying that same name, which kind of just reverses the two elements. And Sakam, like Sagamore, what does that mean? It's it's a leader. So after her husband dies, she is the great leader of the tribe that is ruling over Wakefield and the areas around it. And she has three sons and probably a daughter. So there is Wanahakwam, who gets known as John. There's Matawampati, who gets known as James. And as you can see, James and John die in 1633, both of smallpox. They die very early on. So we don't know as much about them as that third brother down there, who as you can see, I've given him five different names and he's actually known by other names because he lives another 50 years. When a Poikin, when a Perkett, he's also associated with Wakefield. And then with a question mark next to her name is Yawada, who is a daughter and she's attested in later sources. So she probably did exist. That probably was her name. But I tend to be very conservative about this. And because we don't have that name in the 17th century, so far as I can find, I do have to put a question mark next to her. So that's the family that's ruling this area when Europeans arrive. And let's just take a look at that area for a moment. This is the earliest map we have of this region. And it's made by a man named William Wood in the year 1634 and see if you can find Wakefield on that map, right? You can see uh, there's Boston down there, this 
kind of peninsula sticking out. To its left is Newtown, what would be uh, Cambridge. To its right, you can see Medford up there, and there's Spot Pond. And if you look just to the right of Spot Pond, there's another kind of pond there. And I'm pretty sure that's Lake Quanapowit. So here you are looking at that map. And to the right of Lake Quanapowit, down the Saugus River, there is Sagamore James. And Saugus is right there, which is an old native name for that region, one of the only ones remaining. And if we went instead to the left, to the other side of Spot Pond, to the other side of Medford, there's Sagamore John. Right, so we're kind of between James and John here, their settlements, which have been greatly reduced because of disease, but they are the ones who are ruling the area when wood is here in the very early 1630s. And if you look far to the north, you can see there are some other native villages there, and those are going to be villages of, on the top left there, you see it says Penacook, which is the tribe to the north. And here, if you, here's the map from 1634. This is a map that was created many, many years later in 1928 by a man named Frank Speck, who was an early anthropologist of native peoples. And he went through all the deeds of all of the Native American tribes that he could find and created a territorial map based on what he saw. And if you look for Wakefield, you'll see we're in this area with lines that go from the uh, upper right to the lower left. And that indicates for him that this is Massachusetts territory, that that first family were Massachusetts people. And the 2C, 2B, 2A there are those three brothers as he's reconstructed them, right? So Wakefield very definitely within that region. And how does he know that? Because again, he looked at deeds, which is how we know who legally had the right to Wakefield under, at least under the British um, deed system that they brought uh, before the British arrived, who they went to to get title to land, which was so important to the British. So here is the deed of Squaw Sockham. Now, mind you, by 1637, her two oldest sons are dead. He has, she has the one son remaining, George, who seems to have been underage, perhaps. And she signs her, her symbol. And if you look there, this is from the original document. And an English person has written the Squaw Sockham. And to the right, that's her symbol, which is a bow and arrow, which is a really interesting symbol um, for a female leader to have. And below that is her partner, a man named uh, Webb Kowitez, who was a kind of medicine man. And I'm not sure, quite sure what his mark is. But what they are signing their name to there, they are signing away a vast territory in exchange for um, not a whole lot of money. Um, not money, of course, as we would understand it, but goods. Um, about 30 or 40 coats, wampum, which are which are uh, shells, very precious shells that are made from clams, a whole lot of them that was used as currency at the time. Um, but compared to what they're giving away land, they don't really get that much. And as I argued at the paper that Benny heard and that I don't have time to talk about uh, today, it was really from my point of view under duress and threat of violence that this that they are really have to make that sale at that moment. And what are they selling away? Uh, it's everything inside the red there. So here's the same map before. And that territory you see there is the reconstructed area of what Squaw Sockham or Sunk Squaw um, sold. And as you can see, Wakefield, again, is right there in the center of that map. And in 1644, a few years later, um, as you can see there, a number of Native leaders uh, actually give up and submit to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. They say they voluntary and without constraint or persuasion of their own free motion, put themselves under the government and jurisdiction of Massachusetts. And a lot of that is because of the fact that they are in conflicts with other tribes. They are very weakened because the people who lived around here lost a lot of people, maybe 90, 95% of their people to disease by this point. And so they're in a very difficult position and they give up their sovereignty to Massachusetts at this moment. So here we are in 1644, and all of this seems to be over. But if you know Wakefield history at all, if you've looked into this, you know that there's another deed in Wakefield. In 1686, there is another deed signed over that includes the entire town of what was then Reading, which of course, later Wakefield uh, is a part of that. So what exactly is going on here? So if you look at the top there, to all Christian people to whom this present deed of confirmation, ratification, and alienation shall come. So they are confirming something that happened before. And the number one person on this deed is a man named David uh, Kunchamusha, who is the grandson of that youngest son 
of that first family. But also among the names further down is James Quanapowit of Natick. So there's your Quanapowit for Wakefield, right? That that he's the one who, um, uh, right, who is one of the names being put to this. And he is said to be a relative of that first family. And people have often thought maybe he's the son of the daughter Yawada, but it's not really clear. Why are they doing this if the land was already handed over 50 years before? Uh, it has to do with politics at the time. Uh, Charles II of England had just died. There was a new king on the throne, James II. And one thing that kings sometimes did is they showed up in their colonies and said, well, you know, as king, I have proper ownership over this land. And I think you stole it from the native people. So therefore, because you don't have proper title to the land, I'm taking it. So people here in Massachusetts were very fearful that the new king would do this. So they went around and they basically found all the descendants of that original family and had them sign these documents just to be sure to make sure their land would not be taken from them by the king. So as a result, you get this second set of deeds. Uh, James Quanapowit, I, I just want to spend one second on him because the most significant um, physical aspect of Wakefield, obviously, is Lake Quanapowit. And I think it is remarkable that you have this very important part of your town that is named after uh, this particular historical figure, this man who is probably a grandson of that first family. And honestly, if I were in your position, after you come up with your land acknowledgement, I would think, how can we recognize this more and maybe partner with the people of the Massachusetts tribe to put up a plaque or a sign or something by Lake Wanapau and honoring this guy? So in 1676, it is King Philip's War, and he and his people are taken to what is essentially a concentration camp, which is Deer Island. And they are put there through the winter and given very little to survive because at that time, white people were so afraid of native peoples in Massachusetts, they just put them out on that island. And James Quanapowit volunteers to be um, a spy, if you will, among um, enemy tribes. So he goes out to king tribes that are allied to King Philip and he reports counterintelligence on them. And he's given this medal that you see there by the uh, colony of Massachusetts. And this, this medal, by the way, is kept by the Smithsonian Institution. It's the at the Museum of the National American Indian, National American of the it, National Museum of the American Indian uh, in New York City. So it's a very interesting thing that I think Wakefield should take advantage of. But in conclusion, because I wanted to keep it to 10 minutes and I probably didn't do such a good job. Uh, if you wanted to know who lived here, and I've seen your draft version of, um, of the land acknowledgement, and I think it gets, gets it right. If you went through everybody who's in that first family, uh, Nani Pashamet, some people say that he was a Pawtucket, a tribal group I haven't even mentioned so far because there's no record of them. Uh, until much later, even though a lot of things you read online now will say, oh, the Pawtucket ruled over Wakefield in the area. Um, there's no identity ever given to him. His name is only mentioned one time in the record in 1623. Other than that, we would never know what his name was. Um, Squasakum, she's called the Massachusetts Queen. That's who she is. Uh, her son Sagamore John is called the Prince of the Massachusetts. We get nothing for the Pawtucket Confederation in the 17th century. Uh, and this, what is maybe more significant is that if you go looking for the Pawtucket people today, you, you won't find them. There, there aren't people who claim um, that name, but there are people who claim um, descent from the Massachusetts and from this family. And that is the Massachusetts at Ponkapog. So I think I have done enough talking at this point. So I could be quiet. That's the end of my presentation. I hope that was helpful and I will stop sharing my screen now. And here I am. So hopefully it made sense. Jim, thank you so much. That was like a was very good. brief, but like very helpful amount of information. Oh, good. Uh, I don't know, do folks have questions? We can do a little Q&A portion if anybody has questions or, or even like thoughts, reactions. Go ahead, Sherry. Jim, I'm just asking for um, a clarification. So you're saying that there was a tribal entity called the Massachusetts and that is, those were the first people here in this area? They were the people who were here when the Puritans arrived. And of course, 
we know this from one very, very obvious fact, which is they decided to name their new colony Massachusetts because those were the people who they found here. And this is a little bit um, of an issue for the Massachusetts people today because other tribes, you mention their name and you say, oh, sure, the, this, you know, the Cherokee tribe or what have you. And when they hear the word Massachusetts, everyone thinks of the state and nobody even thinks about the fact that they are a tribal people uh, because the state was so successful at co-opting that name. So yes, it was the Massachusetts who were here. And it's spelled like the state, only no S at the end? Uh, yeah, it, it varies because in the 17th century they did vary spelling, but uh, the Massachusetts at Ponkapog today don't have the S on the end. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Go ahead, Danielle. Um, my internet connection was unstable, so it kept like freezing and then starting back up. Um, but I had a question about, I think it was James Quanapowit. And so is, is, was he here because I had attended um, one of the Hartshorn houses like historical readings and they seem to have research where there wasn't anyone named Quanapowit or there wasn't a tribe named Quanapowit, but the English settlers just liked the name and that's why they named the lake after Quanapowit. But I just find it interesting. I mean, there's always going to be competing sources. And so I don't know what was said because the screen froze at all of these. And I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't know what you said. OK, oh, so no, did it freeze again? Daniela, you're looking a little frozen, but hopefully, hopefully you can you can hear this. I don't know. Uh, but James Quanapowit, at the time when he is brought here in 1686 to sign this deed, he is living in Natick. And there's a reason for that. In the 1650s, the people of Massachusetts decided that, OK, we've purchased all of this land, all of the native off of the native people. And this is a universal experience of indigenous peoples. In the eyes of colonists, the biggest problem with indigenous peoples is that they are in the way. And the colonists always want to get them out of the way. And so the way the people of Massachusetts did that is they said, great, we're going to put you in what are called praying towns. And you have to live in this town. And there will be a white minister there who will instruct you in Christianity. And one of them was Natick. So that is where he happened to be. Uh, and there is a native community at Natick that lasts quite some time. And nowadays, they those folks are um, um, they they have a tribal group also. Uh, so that's where he is, and he's brought up here because they need somebody to sign the deed who is part of that family. Now, as for why Lake Quanapowit became Lake Quanapowit, I do have a theory on that, which is up until 1847, it was known as the Great Pond or Great Redding Pond, and the most significant thing to happen in Wakefield's history in the past two centuries probably is the railroad came through. So in 1845, the railroad comes through and they're hoping to sell more land to people who want to live in a suburb. And one thing you could do is to try to come up with more romantic names. So I think the Reading Town Meeting probably got out this name, saw that it was associated with the town because of the deed and said, oh, doesn't that sound like a much more attractive and interesting name? than Great Pond or Great Redding Pond, and, and it stuck. Now, interestingly, Horn Pond was briefly renamed Kuchamakan Pond, but that one didn't stick. So yeah, that, that's the only reason, it's aesthetics. And I think because it was just aesthetics, that memory was lost and you don't have no, you know, I had no idea, for instance, that Quanapowit was the person. That was news to me. Thank you. Hopefully you'd, I didn't freeze too much. No, just the yeah. beginning part. I think it was the end of my question, but covered it. Thank you. I love your idea, Jim, too, of um, doing something to highlight this history more in town. And I think there's so much just, there's like so many aspects of indigenous history and especially like, colonization that play out in this story that you just told us like the praying town the forced migration i mean forced removal the um i've also heard a story and i don't know if this is true about um you know well no it's it the piece of what you were just saying about how james quanapowit was like a spy 
for the colonists in King Philip's war, right? So this idea of like native peoples being pitted against one another and just the history of King Philip's war and how that affected our region. Just like, there's like a million things that all play out kind of in the story of this one man. It's not just his story, but in terms of memorializing him in town, it could also be a memorial to like all these stories. Right, and and to complicate things, the man who was probably his great uncle, um, the man called Winnipurkit or Winnipoikin or um, um, or, or possibly Sagamore George, he actually fought on the other side. He was allied with Philip, and as a result, he was captured and he was sent to the Caribbean to be enslaved for several years. And because there was a white minister back here in Massachusetts who very much liked him, he worked very hard to get him back. So he was brought back to Massachusetts after serving as a slave in Barbados, if I recall correctly, um, and is here. But his great nephew, probably, uh, James Quanapowit was on the opposite side. So you can see even in one family how colonization imperialism creates this dilemma. Okay, that was the story I was going to tell. And then I was like, I'm not going to remember this story correctly. I'm just not even going to say it. But there you go. We were on the same page. So uh, do people have any other like questions or thoughts before we move on slightly to the land acknowledgement, which we can also, you know, it ties in with this. Jim, it's just really to thank you for coming and um, talking with us. I feel like I could listen to you for another like three hours. I realize that that's not possible, um, but thank you really what for- what you wish for. Right, right, I guess. Um, but thanks for also weighing in on our draft too, because I think it's it's obviously important and we'd love to have as much sort of input to make sure that we get it right. So more of a thank you than anything else. Thank you, thank you, Eileen. And, yeah, and, sure. per, and perhaps in October, when we're planning um, commemoration of Indigenous people, we could have you speak to a larger audience than just this group. I, I, I think that that I'd be certainly willing to do that. With Indigenous Peoples Day, I, I do always have to say, though, uh, make sure to keep the Indigenous voices centered. So I was really happy with the Melrose event that you could hear from me and then you could hear from yes. um, Sagamore Gray. And and I made it a point that I would go first so that he could correct anything that I had to say also. Uh, but it but it worked out really well. Um, I think that, that, you know, one, you know, you have to start planning that very early, I think, these days, because one difficulty with so many Massachusetts cities and towns now doing Indigenous Peoples Day is um, is being able to schedule speakers. It becomes a burden for them um, also in the Indigenous community. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking we can look at um, the land acknowledgement draft that Eileen and I put together and got some input on. I'm gonna, let me share this and then I'm gonna read it just so that everybody, um, you know, can respond to it if you don't have it in front of you. So I included in the document I shared the evolution of these drafts, mostly just for your enjoyment. Uh, but I'm just going to read the most recent version. So it says, the Wakefield Human Rights Commission acknowledges that the land we now call Wakefield are the, the lands we now call Wakefield are the ancestral homelands of the Massachusetts people who have been the caretakers of the unceded land for centuries and will continue to be for centuries to come. We are settlers. The Massachusetts people have been tirelessly striving for human rights, even in the face of land theft, genocide, and forced removal. The work we do to build a more unified, equal, and diverse community grows out of the efforts, leadership, and guidance of countless Native communities. We commit to honoring this continued Native activism as we do our work. In doing so, we dedicate time at the beginning of each meeting to help educate those in the community about the Native people of Massachusetts, past, present, and their work towards the future. We stand with the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog in their fight to prohibit the use of Native American mascots in the Commonwealth. And then each meeting we would have some something that we would um, contribute or, or bring up um, that would sort of be a evolving different 
you know, a different experience in each meeting. So, but the part up until that very last sentence would be what we would share in each meeting. And one thing that we talked about when we were putting this together is this last sentence. We, we wanted to acknowledge sort of current events or current activism that's happening. And since the mascot is such a present issue in Wakefield, the sort of current event or current activism that we wanted to include was this piece about the mascot. So that could potentially change over time, as could any aspect of this statement. But I just wanted to speak a little bit about why we included like such a specific thing in, in the land acknowledgement. Um, so yeah, that is what we wrote. And the vision is one, to share it at um, our public events, like at the beginning of a, um, of a, you know, um, what's the one that's coming up? International Women's Day, like any of our events that we're having, starting them out with the land acknowledgement, also starting our public meetings with the land acknowledgement and possibly using this as a way to model or influence other bodies in the town, either the town council, the school committee, like wherever other places. I think the town council is possibly considering writing a land acknowledgement. I got like some whiff of this recently in an email exchange. So anyways, the hope I think would be to be able to model and um, and share this, uh, this statement with other bodies in town. So that is where we are now. I would love to hear people's um, reactions to that, thoughts, changes, ideas, any kind of stuff. Yeah, Elizabeth. I love most of it, like the vast majority of it. Um, I'm wondering about shifting the phrase stand with to something that is not standing. Um, I would love to see us um, shift our language to something more inclusive, uh, like side with or be with. Um, and I know um, removing ableist language is a growing edge of mine, which is probably why I noticed it. Um, and that's, that's a piece that I would like to see shift, but I love the rest of it. <laughs> That's a great point. Thank you, Elizabeth. Sherry, I see you, go ahead. And by extension, I'm thinking, rather than have all these different town bodies have different statements, we should have one statement for the town and it seems like we would be the appropriate group to spearhead it. So this particular statement would also have to go before other groups and determine their level of comfort with that statement and see if they have any input. Because I, th I think it would be best if we had one town statement, not a bunch of different ones. Because we're all trying to get to the same ends. I don't know though. I mean, what's wrong with having different statements? Like people will come at it from different perspectives. Maybe you would be exposed to a variety of different ideas if you were hearing different language acknowledgements. Like I'm thinking about one of the things we tried to incorporate into this as well is making it specific to a human rights context, right? And, and speaking to the ways in which we are, we benefit from the, the legacy and tradition of human rights work within indigenous communities. And we also looked at the, the land acknowledgement statement that the English teacher at Wakefield High did when they did that, like um, there was a theater event you all know what I'm talking about. There was a theater event. And at the beginning of it, they did a land acknowledgement and we contacted him and he sent it to us. And he had a similar uh, like strategy. He was like, I wanted to speak about theater and the ways in which uh, indigenous, uh, indigenous peoples are important to acknowledge in the world of theater and how the contributions that they've made. So we wanted to make it specific to human rights. and. Anyway, my point is, I don't think it's necessary for there to be only one statement ever in the whole town. 
I'm thinking there could be a core statement and then those variations, just like you said that we would have changing additional information after reading the statement, um, can be where the different groups can personalize it to their context. But I'm thinking, you know, I, I still feel like if we had a, the core of it was something that everyone could use as our acknowledgement for the town of Brookfield, and then they would add to it for their particular body that they're speaking to. I, I love the idea, Sherry. I think because we're one of the first people to sort of do this for the town of Wakefield, it's a really nice opportunity for us to be like, look, this is what we've done for our group. And now as other you know, town council or whatever it happens to be decides that they'd like to also do that, maybe there, this changes over time and it does eventually become something that's a little more unified. Um, but I really like the idea of like, we're starting with the HRC and then as we move on, right, maybe on, in different groups, they're like, oh, we'd love to sort of hop on to what you're using and make an adjustment. Maybe it gets to that point um, where it does become, become a more unified, um, you know, sort of acknowledgement across the town, but being able to make a few adjustments there too. Because the two of you did the heavy lifting for others to use. I mean, you did a, a lot of work uh, to get to this point. And I just wonder if the other groups would devote as much time and effort and this would give it something to them as a, you know, that they could use. And then they, I guess they could add their personal opinions after, you know, at the end of it, after the general statement, because the core statement um, would have been written for them. And, and it is all about human rights, whether it's us or another town body. Jim, I'm so curious to hear your thoughts. I know I invited you to stay and give us your reaction since you have some experience doing this already. Oh my goodness, put me on the spot like this. Uh, no, I, I I really like the statement. Um, I And I know I kind of sound like a broken record with this, but if, if you haven't shown it to the Massachusetts, you know, to get to get their feedback and to find out um, what, what they think about it, because there may be something, and I can't see anything myself um, that they would object to that, that would not be obvious to us as settler colonist people. Um, and I guess to, to Sherry's point, I think once you have this done, it'll probably go on your website or, or be in some public place and anybody can look at it and borrow from it if they want. But that doesn't mean you have to create something that's going to work for everybody. And of course, the part I think about is that last line uh, about the mascot, which I'm guessing that there are some groups in Wakefield who would not be comfortable uh, putting that on. But it's so important for this group to keep that on, right? Um, so yeah, it, I guess maybe not everybody is ready to get to the same place right now, and that's okay. Yeah, well, and I'm glad so you mentioned sorry. that piece about the Massachusetts. So it is totally our intention to bring it back. We our our goal was to do as much of the work as we could first before being like, "Hey, help us write our statement." Um, so that's our hope is to then if it's looking okay to this group, make whatever other edits we need to make and then um, bring it back for any input or approval from them. All right, forgot to we, mention. We shared a version of this with the MCN AA and they did make a couple of little adjustments and that's how we then sort of took another look at this again. So um, to Benny's point, like any changes that we make here, we'll send to them again and have them take another look at it to make sure that we're, that we got it right. Do folks have any other thoughts or reactions or changes that you think would be good to incorporate? I just, uh, I, I agree with Elizabeth's statement. Um, as far as just changing that wording. But other than that, I think it's really good. I think it's really well thought out. It does come from a human rights lens. So it's very personalized as far as coming from the HRC. Um, and 
Yep, I totally lost it. But I was gonna say, yeah, other than that, I, I like it. Um, sorry, my camera's off, because I'm hoping that will help prevent my computer from freezing. Oh, I remembered it. Um, I also agree with Eileen's idea of just like setting the tone, um, being the first is okay to release this sort of statement. Um, and I think it's completely in our wheelhouse to do so. Um, well, cool. So we will incorporate that change, <clears throat> Elizabeth, that you suggested, and then reach out and seek any input or approval from the Massachusetts tribe at Ponca Pog. Um, and then we'll probably bring you back an update next month. All righty. I just wanted to thank you guys for, all, I mean, this was, this was a lot of work. So thank you very much. And I think it, I, I didn't have any comments because I think it's, it's great. And I agree with the comments that have been made, but just wanted to thank you all. Yeah, happy to work on it. Eileen did a lot of the work. We also, you know, shout out to uh, Rafa Nicoletta, who is a, a friend of Daniela's, who we called upon again. He helped us during Indigenous Peoples Day last year, and then we asked him to help us also during this because he had a bunch of insider thoughts about writing. He's written some land acknowledgments before, so that was also really helpful. Okay. I'm going to move us on to the next thing on the agenda. Jim, you're welcome to stay and hang out during our totally exciting meeting, but you definitely don't have to if you don't want to. And I appreciate the time that you spent with us. Uh, let's see. Okay, so next um, we're gonna go sort of backwards towards what we normally do at the beginning of the meeting and do the approval of the minutes. So I sent out the minutes that Sherry had, or no, Sherry had sent out originally and I included in the packet the minutes from last month's um, Human Rights Commission meeting. Does anybody have any edits that need to be made to that? If there's no corrections or edits, uh, anyone is welcome to make a motion. To approve I, minutes. I make a motion to approve the meet, HRC meeting minutes from January 18th of 2022. Second. Thanks, Maria. Okay, Daniela, how do you vote on that? Yes. Elizabeth? Yes. Nicole? Yes. Sherry? Yes. Eileen? Yes. Jeremy? Maria. Yes. I also vote yes. We have one, two, three meetings of the Martin Luther King Jr. and Credit Scott King Day subcommittee um, that all can be approved in a lump if the, we have enough, yeah, Nicole and Jeremy are both here, yeah. So that's, I think the two of you, if you were present for those meetings can approve those minutes even though the trace is not here. Is that right? Is there somebody else who's on that second committee? No, it's just the three of you. Okay. Uh, okay. So then, would either one of you like to propose, or are there any changes that need to be made to those minutes that were sent out? I don't think so. <laughs> but uh. Uh, okay, then you can propose either one of you uh, a motion to approve the three as like a lump. Uh, you're muted, Jeremy. Yeah, I was gonna say anybody can make the motion; they just can't vote. So, oh, so just have okay, to be cool. us too. Good to know. But I make a motion that we approve the um, packet of the MLK CSK uh, subcommittee planning meeting minutes as presented. I second. <laughs> Great. Well then, Jeremy, how do you vote on that? Yes. Nicole. Yes. Great. And uh, so I was mistaken. I had thought, I don't know, I made this up. I must have been confusing it with the MLK CSK Day notes. I thought I already had the International Women's Day notes, which I didn't have. 
So I wasn't able to include them in the meeting packet yesterday. My question to anyone who understands the rules of this body better than I do is, can we vote on them if they weren't distributed with the meeting packet to the whole group? I mean, I'm not sure, but you're always safe to just wait and do it next meeting if there's a question. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, there's no harm in waiting, I don't think. But since there's the only people who are going to vote are the people who are actually at that meeting, those meetings, which are the, you know, myself and Eileen and Maria, you know, it doesn't, does it really make a difference if the other people have read it yet and we'll see, or we'll see it after the fact. That's the question, I guess. I, I think that it probably does because we don't use just a consent agenda. So if we were just to toss everything, like all of our minutes onto the consent agenda and just like flat approve them all without going through them each separately, I think we probably could. But because we specifically ask, are there any like adjustments or needs or anything. I think that's also a chance for anyone who wasn't at the meeting to ask for clarification on something. And so then I think we do have to wait until everybody has seen them. Will that then also affect the timing of the event, assuming that we wouldn't vote on these until after the International Women's Day event? I don't think approving the minutes has we'll any okay. yeah. yeah, I'll just indicate in the um, in minutes that we're tabling approval. Yeah, so we can do those uh, next month. And I have them. I have the notes now from you, Sherry. So, and any any additional meetings that take place between now and next month, you can feel free to send those to me. And I oh, will yes. be sure to include them <laughs> in next month's meeting packet. Yes. Okay. So then, moving on, I would love to hear. I don't know. Nicole or Jeremy, which of you wants to report out about what's happening with the um, the video for the Martin Luther King and Curtis Scott King Day event? I mean, I can I can quickly do some, and Jeremy can add, and then I have to I have to leave. Um, but um, yeah, so we've got a video up. Um, Amy with WCAT just sent it over for us to look at, and it looks great. I was I'm really pleased with it, and it will be shown on Monday. Monday, Monday, right, Jeremy? Um, Monday yeah. uh, through the day on their YouTube channel, Facebook, and then on the um, the channel on the television. I think that that's it, unless Jeremy had a. Yeah, no, uh, no more, no more uh, to add. Don't want to spoil the surprise, but yeah, it will. Uh, it will go live on on Monday, so President's Day. Um, so yeah, cool. And it has, I think, all the features that we wanted um, in there. We were able to capture um, through the electronic format. So kudos to Amy for helping us put it together. She came to our last um, subcommittee meeting and worked through it with us. So it should be pretty good. So hopefully everybody enjoys it. So it's an on-demand video. Uh, no, it's going to air on, on WCAT. Oh, so then can I have the exact it. time? It, I think just through the day. I don't know. We don't know the time. I'm sorry. But um, it's going to be on their YouTube channel whenever, like yeah, on demand, you like can, you said. Yeah, you can watch it anytime. Yeah. Oh, so it, it will be on demand after its initial showing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's how they did it last year. Would you, either of you, I don't think I know Amy. You're not talking about Amy Rando, right? You're talking about somebody from WCAT. Amy Coulter, C-O-U-T-U-R-E is her last name. Mm -hmm. She works with WCAT. Yeah, Amy Couture. Couture, yes, yeah, thank you. Because <laughs> uh, I was thinking if she sends the video, if, if she sends, or if you already have it, if, if somebody sends me the video, I can uh, upload it onto our Facebook page also. Or, is that what I did? Maybe last year I just linked to their page. I can't even remember. Um, well, let me, I'll, I mean, either Jeremy or myself, we can email it and make sure that that's the final, that, that treat, Teresa didn't have a correction or something. And then when she sends the final, then we can, I'll have, we can have her send it to you or whatever. Yeah, we'll figure it out. So. 
Okay, I will plan to just put, I had already posted it on our Facebook page, like keep an eye out, like, you know, coming soon, the video of the MLK Day event, but I'll put another one up there saying, you know, that it will become available on Monday and everybody should check it out. Thank you. Hi, Nicole, thank you. Mm, anything else having to do with that event? Uh, nothing unless there's questions to answer, but I mean, it's pretty much a done deal at this point, which is nice, so. <laughs> thank you for all the work that you guys put into that. I feel like there was a lot of work to begin with and then like a whole nother month's worth of work trying to pivot it into this um, recorded version. Yeah, I haven't actually watched it. It's like the Dropbox that they provided, so I'm, probably going to check it out like later tonight i was busy all day but uh Teresa did a lot of work on it too so unfortunately she's not here to accept her kudos but she did a lot you know she was a fearless leader so kudos to her yeah uh jeremy i have to say your antlers are looking particularly excellent tonight it's like you moved your desk maybe or something they're like I, i'm on a I'm on my work laptop because it's much more stable. Like the last couple of meetings I was losing here and there. So, but I don't have the, like the blurred background. So they, they actually like stick out like right in my head, right? <laughs> like right here. So. I love it. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> so it's a very important human rights issue, but uh, let's see. So then I would love to hear whatever updates you have to share with us about the International Women's Day event. I don't know who's reporting back on that one. Such, such a work in progress. Um, it's going to be virtual. Um, we found out that even though we did reserve the high school theater, just in case, we would need much more lead time than we have to coordinate with WCAT to turn it into a live event. And there were a lot of considerations, which will show up in the minutes that when everyone sees them, of why this will work out better. Um, we have just about completely we've gotten the commitments for our panel we still have one more person we wish we could get the panel is women who all have um, international backgrounds so they're covering just about every continent we have someone from uh, south america our own teresa um, we have someone from the caribbean sarah team who a lot of people know uh, stephanie south from germany um, some summer from Jordan, uh, so that's West Asia, the Middle East, and then we have, um, oh, Maria is going to have to remind me, uh, also a person from the Far East. The one, one thing we're lacking is we would really love to have someone whose family came here, or well, came here personally from Africa. Um, the theme is break the bias, and the more variety of people we have, and the more variety of cultures and appearances, um, I think the richer the discussion will be on what their experiences have been coming to America and expectations. Um, so we're pretty excited about this. Um, we have had a couple of meetings with WCAT people, and we're working out all of the technical logistics as well. The library generously said they would do it, but now we find that WCAT could probably set up the whole Zoom and the registration for us. Um, promo is starting this week. Maria and Eileen, please add to that because you have different perspectives from the different aspects you've been working on. I think Sherry, you covered it, um, which is great. I think uh, working with the library would, would have been lovely too, but I think WCAT really sort of handles all of the logistics. We're so lucky to be able to have them to help us. And um, I'm happy that Amy was able to attend the meeting last last week, but um, yeah, I think we have what, a panel of six individuals. Maureen is gonna um, uh, be our uh, host, which I think will be really great. And now we're working on questions that um, we'll wanna make sure that we're filtering to the, the panelists before they join. But yeah, that's where we are. I think it'll be great, good event. Yeah. Am I asking what? Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. 
No, 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 that's okay. Um, the only thing I wanted to add is I know we were thinking of possibly meeting this Thursday and I dropped the ball and forgot to uh, request a meeting time. So I will connect with the two of you and we'll figure out um, something hopefully early next week. Sorry about that. I feel your pain, Maria. I feel it. <laughs> I, I thought I missed something in, in the barrage nope. of Gmail nope. that comes in. No, nope. when I was thinking about this meeting tonight, I was like, oh no, I forgot to request it. Okay. So I was going to ask if you have, I don't know if you've gotten to this point yet, but I'm curious what the questions are like, what you, what, how you're hoping to shape the panel, kind of like what the tone is or what the direction is that you're thinking about. It's, it's going to be pretty personal. Um, we're going to start by giving everyone a minute or two to talk about who they are and where they came from and, and if they're comfortable with the circumstances under which they came here. And some of the things we're going to ask is what expectations they had. Um, also, I thought there was a wonderful question. I'm not sure who, who asked it, but they said everybody leaves something behind. And we were going to ask people what it is they felt they might have lost or left behind that by, by leaving the land where their, where their heritage is. Um, also just to talk to them about, you know, ask them to talk about the, maybe even the challenges of holding on to the, that, those important aspects of their cultural or their heritage in a new country. Um, so it's, it's really gonna be personal, but we're also gonna, we're going to also include once we have our questions, we're going to ask Maureen's, Maureen's input as well because she's her family's from Pakistan. She's an American citizen born here, but her family is very, very close to their culture. And um, so for her, she's particularly sensitive to this, but we wanted to concentrate on the international aspect of it, um, different than the last few years. Um, yeah, it's, I, I, the questions are, those have got to be both sensitive, but also specific enough. Um, and we will not ask anything, ask anyone to speak about anything that's outside of their comfort level. Cool. Any other questions, other discussion on the report back there? Well, thank the three of you very much for the work that you're putting into that. I'm excited, looking forward to it. And I will never forget, I feel like it's like seared into my memory that our International Women's Day event was the last live event that existed in the universe before COVID hit two years ago. So I feel like every International Women's Day event that we have is this like interesting anniversary event for me. <laughs> I remember going in there and being like, handshake, maybe not. Do we not shake hands anymore? Is that how this works? <laughs> and then I'm just the next hoping, day, like two days later, it was like, okay. Now I'm just hoping we have a lot of little girls participating because they always have the best questions. Yeah. <sighs> okay, well, I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna be great. Mm, let's see. Yana, unfortunately, already had to leave. So we won't get any updates on the youth council. Steven isn't here, so we're not gonna get any updates on the school committee. Mental Health Awareness Month was also, it was both Yana and um, Lindsay were gonna have been working on that, but neither of them unfortunately are here. So flying through the agenda, they, I, I got an email from Lindsay earlier today about the fact that she wasn't gonna be able to be here. And she said that she and Yana are meeting on Friday. So they're moving forward with their Mental Health Awareness Month stuff that they're working on. So next month, we will certainly have some updates from them. Um, let's see the budget. We had said last month that we wanted to look again at the budget. I don't know, Sherry, if you were able to get any more detailed information about like what money is in which account and this whole question of like, what do we have to spend? The real question is, what do we have to spend by the end of June? And what is flexible because we need to kind of know that distinction. Did you find any more? Unfortunately, I have not. I'm sorry. Okay. Do you feel like you have what you need to find out the answer? Or are you like hitting a wall or anything? I feel like I almost have to 
go to town hall instead of trying to just send emails to Jackie. What is that her name? Just Jackie Sorrento. Um, it's because I don't I mean I didn't even get reports this month, and I had asked her to make sure she sends me reports every month, and she's now out for a few days, so I couldn't get any information at all. But I, I think I, I might have to see if I can have a phone call with her, send the email, something. Um, although I think she works remotely a lot of the time. But I will try harder and have that info and we need that information for next month. Yeah, and I mean, let me know if there's anything that would be helpful for any of us to do or for me to do. I'm happy to throw my weight around as the chair of the HRC. This actually is not a very helpful suggestion because I've been trying to throw my weight around on some other issues and I have not had any success. Mm. Uh, but yeah, if you need any support, let us know, but we will definitely need to get that information at some point in order to understand what money, what, how much money we have. Okay, to be continued on that one. The next thing on the agenda is the thank you notes to people and or businesses in the community. This was something, Jeremy, that you had brought up and we said that we were gonna think more about it this month. Um, I don't know if you have any, if you like have something specific that you wanted to, to start with. Um, I do not only because of like focusing on the MLK CSK stuff. Um, I don't know if other people have had I've thought about it since our last meeting or you know if if it's a go from us or or what um we had talked last meeting about it just being more of a handwritten note from the hrc rather than like a you know a formal award or something because i think it doesn't hold the same meaning correct me if i'm wrong if people still feel that way or don't but um i definitely uh i definitely still think we should do it um but I didn't think about like sort of logistics since the last meeting. I'm actually just pulling up the notes because I don't totally remember like where we left it last time. Because <clears throat> yeah, it was it was brought up in the at the very end with a new. Oh yeah, that matters not anticipated. I remember. Yeah. Yes, it was like right at the end of the meeting. Okay, we said we will wait to start this program until after the Martin Luther King, Curtis Scott King Day service awards are presented so it doesn't get sort of like, so that it doesn't, what's the word, like take away from those awards. Yeah, so if, if you guys want, I can kind of put a plan together uh, between now and the next meeting on sort of, you know, like a, a mock, plan of how to run it or you know what to do or what i envision and then we can put it out for discussion and yeah, try to put it in place after the next meeting because you know technically we still haven't put the the service awards and stuff out to the public they'll go out monday as part of that video so yeah. um, so maybe that's the best plan so. that sounds good if you want to put something together and like email it to me sometime between now and next time and i can include it so that we yeah. all have something like it's kind of more specific and concrete to consider. Yeah, I, I can do that. So okay. Uh, okay, so I wanted to I sent you all that I forwarded you the email that I got from Tom Mullen uh, at the town, the town, the the lawyer who like represents the town, and about donating money from the HRC to WCAT, and it was unequivocal. We cannot donate money to a uh, to WCAT. Like it was, there was like multiple reasons why this would be like basically illegal. So that was a really nice idea that we can't do, unfortunately. And I encourage all of you, as individual um, humans in the world, to donate to WCAT if you would like to, because it is doubtless that they really like they make our programs possible, basically especially since we've been doing them virtually, so. But that was sadly a no. Uh, 
Okay, so that's the end of our agenda, guys. This has been like a record breaking meeting. We should do this every time, just like skip over a whole bunch of agenda items and don't do anything. Uh, um, it's not that we're not doing anything. The subcommittees are doing all the work, really, is what's happening. Daniela, yes, I see you. Um, last meeting, I think we made a motion to do a donation. So, do we need to do a the opposite of a motion or a correction motion? I I figured we would just like not do the thing, but I don't I don't really know. Do we have Was to do it anything? Pending in approval. Oh, it may have been. So because then we did have to check and make sure the there wasn't. And so, yeah, that's the end. Great. Okay, cool. Let's work for us. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any matters not anticipated that didn't make it onto the agenda that anybody wants to discuss? Yeah, Eileen. It's not it's something that we talked about in the very beginning of the meeting which was around emailing or a distribution list or a newsletter or whatever i emailed jen mcdonald like in december um and then i didn't hear back but it was vacations and a whole bunch of stuff like that so i can follow up with her again to see if we can now do like a distribution list and it was all connected to like when we have in-person events, just having people like write down their name and email address so that we can send updates and those kinds of things. So I'll follow up with her again. Oh, cool. So I didn't realize you already were sort of doing that. Yeah, of course I'm a slacker and that was like three months ago, but it's fine. It's We're fine. Not a slacker. <laughs> um okay well then i'll leave that to you i was gonna maybe email the like email the e the email person the like tech person for the town but maybe i'll wait to see what jen let me know what jen says one thing that i just wanted to let people know about um for uh for those of you that don't have kids in the school system um or, or not on the school system email list um, they do every spring they do something called parent university and um, one of the programs that they're doing this year is a screen it's a Q&A session on the movie Dawnland which is um, about indigenous um, indigenous children that were taken from their families and put into boarding schools um, and if you register for it I don't think that you need to have kids in the school system to register to do this um, and when you do register you get a link um, and you can watch the, the 86 th there's different length versions of the movie but you get a link to watch the 86 minute um, version of the movie on your own time whenever you want prior to the event and then there's a Q&A session so um, just kind of in keeping with continuing to educate ourselves around indigenous rights. This has been on my list of movies to watch um, for a long time and I was really excited to see that. So um, just wanted to let people know. Maria, how would one sign up for that? Um, I will, I'll, I, what I can do is I'll forward the email from the schools to, um, to the Human Rights Commission. I think that's probably the easiest. Cool, yeah. That'd be cool. Anything else? Other it's items? Also, it's also on the town's website. I just found it really quickly by Google. Yeah, I was thinking I could probably just Google. Yeah, it. I Googled <laughs> Wakefield, Massachusetts Parent University and found it pretty easily. Oh, there you go. Thank Great. You. Any other matters not anticipated? Benny, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Question for you. I know it's a public document, so I don't have to ask this, but as a courtesy, would it be okay if I showed your draft to a couple of folks I know who might have some helpful feedback? I would love that. Great. Yeah, let me know what, what comes of it. I will tell them to write to you, and then you'll find out. That will be uh, very direct. Yeah, I appreciate that, thank you. Uh, okay, then let us review the action list. Sherry, what do you have? Not that much. Yeah. 
Okay, so, and most of this is follow up. For instance, the first item is that Benny and Irene will seek input and approval from the Massachusetts Ponkapog people before finalizing and releasing the statement, the land acknowledgement statement um, for MLK CSK event. Um, Nicole will, is this is a reminder, we'll send a link for, of the final version for posting on our Facebook page. I assume that would be sending it to Benny since she's been doing the postings. Um, on the budget, I'm going to be finding out what we need to spend before the end of the fiscal year and what can roll over into the next fiscal year. Jeremy is going to develop a plan on for us to consider at the next meeting on how we might acknowledge people in the community. And finally, Eileen Rooney is going to speak with Jen McDonald about the possibility of developing an email list for the WHRC. Was that accurate, folks? Did I miss? speak in any way or effects? I think so. Okay, well, I'll have the minutes to you in a couple of days. All right. Who would like to adjourn this meeting? Everyone. Uh -huh. I motion to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> I will second. All right. Daniela, what do you think about this uh, this vote that is before you to adjourn yes. this meeting? <laughs> yes. Elizabeth? Yes. Cherry? Yes. Eileen? Yes. Jeremy? Yes. Maria? Yes. I also vote yes, even though it means I will miss you all. <laughs> <laughs>